This morning, every year I ask the Lord to show me in this Christmas story that's so familiar to everyone, something that we, because it's so familiar, may miss, may not see. And one thing that the Lord impressed upon me this year was uh, the place where Jesus lie. Um, thus the title, A Place for Us. But Luke chapter 2, verse 1, And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. Now let me just say, uh, the taxing referred to here isn't one where the uh, res- residents had to pay money. This was more likely a census that was taken uh, in all the land. But the, the law was that you had to go back to your hometown to be counted. So it's much like our census here in America. Verse 2, and this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, everyone into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. I underline that word, great. Verse 6, and so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And I underlined the last part of that verse. There was no room for them in the inn. If you were a king and you were going to visit another country, in fact, if you were going to send your son to another country, where would he stay when he got there? If you were a king, the king of heaven in this, in this case, would you not house your, your child in the most elaborate place in existence in that day? Would you not make sure that there was the softest and most comfy bed that he would be born in? And why would you, if you were the king of the world, why would you send the woman who was Uh, carrying your son on a 90-mile journey in her ninth month. Have you ever thought about the significance of that? How many of you mothers would feel like traveling 90 miles, either on the back of a donkey or even walking in cases, in your ninth month? Nobody. Nobody would sign up for that. It was such an unusual and odd thing. They were going to be um, taxed, they were going to be counted in the census because it was the law of the land. They had to do that. It doesn't matter if you were in your first month of pregnancy or your ninth month, you had to go. And so they were being obedient basically to the government that God placed them under at the time. But it was just so interesting to me that the God of heaven who spoke the world into existence with one word, literally had his son carried for a 90-mile journey in rough times, difficult times. Who would even risk that? How many of you mothers would risk traveling that far when you were pregnant? Nine months. Nevertheless, they did. And then when they got there, there was no vacancy. Have you ever noticed uh, in the Christmas plays that you, you often see where the innkeep, innkeeper comes out and he's like a mean person? There's no room in here. Well, you know, he wasn't really a mean person. It was just, think about it. All the world, the Roman world, was coming to that one place to be taxed. There was no vacancy anywhere. Why would God let his son show up and there was no place for him to be born? There's a lot of questions that I'm going to ask the Lord one day when I see him in heaven. I truly don't know, but I have an indication as to why Jesus was born the way that he was. And you know, it says that he was born in a manger. Do you know what a manger is? Uh, this is this is not the manger. The manger is actually... This is the manger. A manger is a place where 
manger was nothing more than a feeding trough. In fact, the, the word that it comes from means to feed. It was where they put the animals' food to eat. And so there wasn't room in the inn, in the fancy inn. And so where do you go when you're about to be, uh, when you were about to have a child? You go to the first next place. And there's a lot of dispute as to whether or not it was a barn. Seems logical to us in, in our uh, you know, economy, the way we think about things. A barn is where animals go, right? But then there are traditions who say, going way back, that it was actually a cave. And it wasn't uncommon for shepherds of that day in, to have a cave next to where they dwelt, where they put their animals. And then one person that I read, they said it was a house because the way the houses were constructed in those days, the bottom quarters were where they put their most expensive animals. And then the upper room is where the family slept and, and the guests slept. But, but we don't know, and, the, and that's what I want to emphasize. We can't say what the Bible doesn't say. All we know the Bible says is that Mary had a baby and the baby was born and wrapped in swaddling clothes and, and he laid in, uh, she laid him in the manger, a feeding trough, because that's all that was available. And if you, if you look at the significance of that, why would God do that? I don't know the mind of God in all these things, but I do know that he was there for everyone, not just for the elite not for just the religious Pharisees, the people that you know were known in, in the land there. He was there for the common folk. And that probably was the reason he was born in that manner as well. I'm reminded every Christmas that Jesus was born for everyone, not just the elite, not just the powerful, not just the uh, successful, not just the popular, but he was born for everyone. He was born for the lowest of lowest. Who did he appear to? Shepherds. Shepherds were not the most important people in town either. They were even looked down upon on many, many occasions. They did dirty work, really dirty work. If you, if you worked around sheep, you knew that sheep were they're dirty animals. They can't do anything for themselves. They can't wash themselves. So the shepherd worked in a dirty environment, but that's who God chose to send the angel to. And they said, glory to God in the highest. On earth peace, good will toward men. The focus this morning is on the place. Places are important. Back in uh, 1943, during World War II, anyone remember back then? Bing Crosby came out with a song that became a timeless Christmas tune. I'll be home for Christmas. Home. There's no place like home for the holidays, 1954, Perry Como. And even Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz said there's no place like home. Where's home for you? My little girl is a missionary in Poland. Uh, when we talk about when you're coming home, she says, I am home. She's home in Poland because that's where God has put her for this last six years. But when we think about her, she still has a room in her house. That's Lydia's room. This is her home. But she's writing a book. And in the book, the emphasis on, is on my home. My real home is heaven. That's my real home. Wherever I am, I am geographically, my real home as a believer is heaven. And where I live until I, I get that day really doesn't matter. Because home is where I live. But when Jesus came, there was no place for him. No room in the inn. And actually that's not really true. Micah the prophet predicted that Jesus would be born in Bethlehem. 700 years before the birth of Christ. Isaiah mentioned that he would be born, what his name would be, where he would be born. The fact that he would be born of a virgin. And Micah the prophet predicted where, he says in Micah 5, 2, But thou, Bethlehem Ephratah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from old, 
from everlasting. That's a reference to Messiah. Because as, as you know, and we mentioned last week, Jesus did not begin to exist in the manger. He existed at the foundation of the world. The book of Colossians tells us that he created the world. Jesus is God. He's not just the Son of God. He is God. And that's difficult for some people to wrap their brain around because we're looking for um, proof. I wasn't there, so I can't prove it. But I believe the Bible is true. And the Bible teaches that Jesus was in the beginning with God, and he was God. And so he was born in the manger, but most importantly, he was born in Bethlehem because the prophet said that he would. That fulfills the scriptures as well. He ultimately came, as we know, to dwell in us. Listen to what Ephesians chapter 3, verse 17 says. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love. And then in the book of Colossians chapter 1, verse 25, we read, Whereof I am made a minister, Paul speaking here, according to the dispensation of God which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God, even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of his glory, of his mystery, of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is, here's the mystery, Christ in you, the hope of glory. So Christ not only came to a place in Bethlehem, there was no room in the inn. There was room in the hearts of people. They say, what's so special about a place? Isn't it the people who live there that are most important? We often pray for our church. And when, when we pray, we're thinking not about a building, but about a people. The church is people. You are, if you're saved. You are part of the universal church. If you're a member of this church, you're part of this local church. But there is a place for, for us in Christ. There's a place for us in Christ, the body of Christ. I read about a man who was promoted to be a manager of a huge warehouse. And as you walk through the warehouse, things were scattered everywhere and nobody really knew where anything was. Have you ever been in a place like that? Sometimes it's my back bedroom. <laughs> There's a place, I don't know where anything is in there. I would get lost in there if it was, if it was much bigger. But uh, his motto, that man's motto became this, a place for everything and everything in its place. You know people like that? I call them OCD. No. <laughs> if you go into their garage, everything is labeled in order. And they know exactly where everything is. That's not my, my garage. But my neighbor is pretty close. He knows where everything is in his garage. But uh, that was his motto. First Corinthians 12 tells us that there's a place for us in the body of Christ. There's a place for us in Christ. Verse 12, 1 Corinthians 12, 12. For as the body is one, and hath many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, or one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been made all to, to drink into one Spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. If the foot shall say, Because I am not the hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear shall say, because I'm not the eye, I'm not of the body, it, it, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where would the be smelling? But now hath God set the members, every one of them, in the body as it hath pleased him. The Apostle Paul wanted the Corinthians the church he wrote that letter to, to understand the truth that there's a place for everyone and that everyone should be in their places in the body of Christ, in his church. Now, the visible representation of the body of Christ is 
the local church. The word church comes from the Greek word ekklesia. Ek means out of, and kaleo is the Greek word that means to call. So a church is literally those who have been called out, called out of the world into the body of Christ. Some people say, well, you really don't need to belong to a church to be a Christian. You ever heard that? Do you believe it? I do. You don't have to be a member of a local church to be a Christian, to be saved. Being, being saved is about placing one's complete faith and trust and confidence in what Jesus Christ did on the cross of Calvary many years ago. So you don't have to be a member of a church to be saved. Some people say, well, faith is a personal thing. So why can't you just have an individual relationship with God? I've heard that argument too. Here's my problem though. How can I learn to love if there's nobody else around? How can I learn to live in humility if I live alone? Is it possible to learn patience, kindness, or gentleness in isolation? No, I believe it's necessary for true believers to be a part of a local church, a family, a place to belong. R.C. Sproul says, It is both foolish and wicked to suppose that we will make much progress in sanctification, that is, the process of becoming like Christ, if we isolate ourselves from the visible church. C.H. Spurgeon said this, I believe that every Christian ought to be joined to some visible church, that is his plain duty according to the scriptures. God's people are not dogs. Otherwise, they might go about one by one. They are sheep, and therefore they should be in flocks. Every believer has a place in the body of Christ, and it's a place to belong. I think that's one of the things that people truly want. They, they truly want a place where they feel like they belong. But there's all kinds of excuses and reasons we have for not doing that. Some people say, well, I used to go to church, and then this happened. I used to go to church all the time, and then the pastor fell into sin. I used to go to church all the time, and then this person was talking about me behind my back, and I found out about it. I used to go to church all the time, but I don't want anything to do with them because all they want is my money and my allegiance, and I don't get anything out of it. I've heard all kinds of arguments before, but the problem is I don't have to give an excuse for, to, to, to people. I have to give an excuse to God. It, it, you know, it, the church is God's. It's his. It, it's his idea. It's not some preacher's idea. It's God's idea. And every child of God needs a place to belong. It's a family. It's a Christian community. It's a support structure. It's a place of fellowship and a place of learning. We should embrace the body of Christ. No, there, there are no perfect churches. Because if you found one, you couldn't be a part of it. Because you're not perfect, are you? I'm not perfect. I'm far from being perfect. I'll be like Christ one day, but I'm still in a process. I'm getting there, aren't you? So we need each other. We need help. We need people to hold our feet to the fire. We need people to give us counsel and show us compassion and love when we're hurting, when we're grieving. Some people to put arms around us and say, listen, we're praying for you. Let's pray with you right now. Some people are afraid to be a part of a church because they've been hurt. And I understand that. Let me ask you this. Have you ever been hurt by your family? Yeah. Do you split with them because you've been hurt by them? Or do you stay with them because you're family? Think about it with me. If you're a child of God, if you're truly saved, God has placed you in His spiritual family and you will always be in that family. And when this body dies and goes back to dust, you will go and be with your spiritual family for how long, class? Forever. Forever. 
forever. Because salvation is an eternal thing. Being a part of the church, universal, is an eternal thing. And so why has God placed us together? To encourage each other. It it says so in in the book of Ephesians. It says, forsaking not the the, the spirit, uh, forsaking not the assembly of yourselves together as a manner of some is, but encouraging each other. Even more as you see the day approaching. And so the reason he's placed us in the body of Christ is to give us a place to belong. And also it's a place to serve him. A place to make a difference for what God who's done so much for us. Romans 12, 5 says, So we being many are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another, having then gifts, differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith, or ministry, let us wait on our ministering, or he that teacheth, on teaching, or he that exhorteth on exhortation, he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity, he that ruleth with diligence, he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. That's just a long, wordy way of saying that God has gifted believers. Every child of God has at least one spiritual gift, and he's given us those gifts not to sit up on the shelf and look at it and say, Look what I can do. He's given us those gifts to serve each other, to be a blessing to each other. To serve him. There's a place for every believer in the body of Christ. There's also a a forever place for believers. And that's in heaven. John 14, 1. Jesus said these words to his closest disciples. These guys hung out with him for three and a half years while he served on this earth. He knew them like nobody else did. Inside out. He said, he sat down with his, these guys and he says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there ye may be also. That place is called heaven. It's an eternal, forever place that Jesus said he's preparing for us. Every time I think about that, I think about creation. You know, the Bible teaches back in the book of Genesis that God spoke the world into existence in six literal 24-hour solar days. It did not take God a billion years to create a rock. The same God that spoke the world into existence created rocks with the appearance of age. He created full-grown trees in the gardens. He created the grass on the ground, the beautiful flowers that he clothes with color. God made it all in six days, and he looked back and said, it is good. It is very good. God spoke, opened his mouth, and from the dust he created man. Now these bodies... Uh, were never designed to last forever. And we're reminded of that every time we lose somebody that we love. These bodies were not created forever. I'm thankful that as a believer I have the promise of of a spiritual body that God gives us. But these bodies won't last forever. But even... Even though they won't last forever, they are an absolute marvel. Our bodies are amazing. If, if you don't believe me, just study biology. Study how the body works, how the cells work, how they come to, if, if there's an infection, how the, the blood rushes to that area. And, you know, that's why it's inflamed. The blood rushes there to heal it. God is the one who made these bodies. He spoke them into existence. They didn't just evolve from some primordial ooze. God had a plan, and he still has a plan. And though these bodies don't last forever, they're wonderful bodies, and I'm thankful. The Bible says, fearfully and wonderful am I made. His creation shows his handiwork. Just notice the the, the change of the seasons. Every year they change. The leaves turn, the leaves fall. Your neighbor has to pick them up for you. 
But then the winter comes and the snow falls, hopefully, this year. Somewhere in the world it is. But the seasons just change automatically. Uh, what caused that? Our creator God caused that. The heavens and the earth declare the glory of God. That's what the scripture says. And it says that Jesus is preparing a place for us. If he created everything in six and a half literal, six literal days that we see with our eyes and smell with our nose and touch with our hands, can you imagine what kind of place heaven is going to be like? The Bible describes just a glimpse of it. It has streets that are pure, transparent gold. The streets are made of gold. Uh, the sun will be out forever. There won't be any more night. You won't ever have to uh, lock your doors because no thief or robber is allowed there. There's no sickness. There's no sorrow. There's no more death. The Bible says that God shall wipe all the tears from our eyes. There's no more hurt. What a wonderful place we have to look forward to. It's a place that He's prepared for us. It's a prepared place. The one who made the rose as intricate as it is. The one who made the mountains. The one who handcrafted the leaves of the trees. The one who made the human body and keeps it alive every day. How many of you had to think about uh, making your heart beat today? Anybody? No, because it just happens. That's how God created you. It's a precious place. John tells us in Revelation that heaven is like this. It has streets of gold, gates of pearl, a great white throne that's surrounded by a rainbow that looks like emerald. Uh, on the throne sits the Lamb of God, and the throne is surrounded by 24 thrones with 24 elders dressed in white robes with golden crowns on their heads. And in front of the throne, there is a sea of glass like crystal. And there's a river, the water of life that flows from the throne of God and through the streets of heaven. And on each side of the river is the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit. And heaven is a big place. Plenty of room for everybody. It's 1,500 miles long, 1,500 miles wide, 1,500 miles high, and with a wall around it built of jasper with its foundation adorned with 12 different precious stones. And then John tells us what's not in heaven. He said there's no more pain, no more tears, no more suffering, no more death, no more sin. It's a populated place, heaven is. The one thing that makes heaven so precious are the people who live there. I have some people that currently reside there. I can't wait for the day that I see them face to face. Only when I do, they won't be in that body that they were in when they left this world. My sweet grandma raised me most of my life. She died of colon cancer. Last time I saw her alive, she was in the hospital. I went in to see her, and she said, Timmy, she's the only one that could call me that. <laughs> She opened up her arms like this. She sat up in her bed with colon cancer to hug my neck. She's with Jesus now, but she's in a new body. Amen. I can't wait to see her. My dad's there. I preached his funeral. It's the hardest thing I've ever done. The only, man, the only way it was possible was because I knew I was going to see him again. The hymn writer, Fanny Crosby, if you know about anything about Fanny Crosby, she was a blind lady. A doctor put the wrong medicine in her eye when she was a little baby. She lost her sight. Never saw anything. But she wrote a song. She, she wrote lots of songs. Uh, it sounds like this. When my life work is ended and I cross the swelling tide. When the bright and glorious morning I shall see, I shall know my Redeemer when I reach the other side. 
and his smile will be the first to welcome me. I shall know him, I shall know him, and redeemed by his side I shall stand. I shall know him, I shall know him, by the prince of the nails in his hand. Listen to this verse. Oh, the dear ones in glory, how they beckon me to come, and our parting at the river I recall. To the sweet vales of Eden, they will sing my welcome home, but I long to meet my Savior first of all. She said, I shall know him, though she never saw him. The first person she would ever see with new eyes would be your Savior. Heaven is a populated place. Are you going there? Can you say with assurance in your heart this morning that when you die, not if you die, when you die, you'll be in heaven? If you ask people that, you get different answers. Sometimes they say, well, I hope so. There was a time in my life when I would have said that. I hope so. Because the way I had been, had been living at that time wasn't anything like a person of faith. I did things that, would, that, that I'm still to this day ashamed of. But you know, just like that baby that came and was placed in the manger for the common person, I was the common person. I needed salvation and Almighty God thought that I was important enough that He sent Jesus to die for me so I could have eternal life and enjoy the bliss of heaven. That's a future place. It could happen at any day. Jesus could return at any time. He said He was going to. With the events taking place in our world today, it's hard to turn a blind eye to the fact that things are wrapping up in this place. I know that there have been wars and rumors of wars for, for years in the Holy Land, but I've never seen it like this before. I know that in the future, the Bible teaches that all the nations of the world will go against one little nation, and it just happens to be Israel. There will be a massive battle called Armageddon, and at the conclusion of that battle of Armageddon, Jesus Christ will return and he will defeat all the enemies who set array against Israel. Amen. That's what the Bible teaches. That's a future event. But it wouldn't take very much at all for all the nations of the world to come against Israel. It's already becoming unbelievable in America that there's are a group of people that are so anti-Semitic in our own country that was founded on the same principles that Israel was founded. And it's because people don't know history for one thing. I would encourage you to find your place in Christ. Verse 9 of Luke chapter 2 says, And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them. And they were so afraid... That means they were terrified. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people, not just the elite, even you shepherds. For unto you is born in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Receive him as your Savior and Lord. He will dwell within you and he will work through you for his glory. He will change your life now and forever. He will forgive every sin you've ever committed. Some people are really confused about salvation. And um, probably because of media and tradition. So many who still believe that salvation comes by performance. 
if I'm good enough. There's honestly people today who believe that, you know, when you die, God takes all of your bad works in one hand, all of your good works in the other hand, and whichever one outweighs the other, that determines where you spend eternity. The, the, now that, that may seem logical, but it isn't biblical. The Bible doesn't teach that at all. Works are important only for believers, but the works aren't to earn salvation. They're to earn rewards given to, at the judgment seat of Christ. That's for believers only. Salvation is so simple that a child can understand it and believe it. It is good news. Good news for sinners. I'm a sinner. The Bible says so. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And there's a price to be paid because of my sin. The wages of sin is death. But it says the gift of God. What's a gift? Is it not something that's given freely? This Christmas, have you, have you been shopping for gifts? Are you giving your gifts based upon how people treated you? If they're in your family, they're in your family, right? You want them to have the best. A gift is given out of love. And the Bible says, For God so loved the world, the world that He made, and the world that rejected Him. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth, trusts, relies upon him. It isn't talking about mental ascent. It's talking about spiritual trusting, relying upon. Whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Have you ever done that? Have you ever trusted Jesus to be your Savior? If you haven't, I want to invite you this morning to trust Christ to save you. You can do that right there in your pew, right where you're sitting. It's as simple as saying a prayer in your own heart that sounds something like this, Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I know I can't save myself. I'm just not good enough. I've tried. But I believe that Jesus came to die for my sins on the cross of Calvary to pay the price that I owed. And Lord, right now, I ask you to save me. Be my Savior. Help me to live for you. I'm trusting forever and ever on what you did, not on what I'm doing. But I trust you today to save me. Now, if you pray a prayer or something like that, it doesn't have to be word for word. It's just a matter of who you're trusting. If you've been trusting yourself, you've proven that you can't do it. Now start trusting Christ and He'll save you. And if you, may, if you pray a prayer like that today, it's important that you let somebody know about it. People want to rejoice with you. So I want to ask you just to stand to your feet right now and we're going to pray together. And then after my prayer, we're going to have a song of invitation, something like Just As I Am. You may have heard that before. And as we sing that song together, Just As I Am, without one plea, uh, if you feel a need, to come up here and let someone know what you've done. You trusted Jesus as your Savior. We want to rejoice with you. So you just come and say, Pastor, I trusted Christ as my Savior today. If you have other needs, if you, if you need someone to pray with you, maybe you're going through a battle right now. Maybe you don't feel like you have enough, enough of you to go around and you need help. You really need support. Well, we'd love to pray with you. This altar is always open. But let's leave our burdens with the Lord today. All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you for loving us. We thank you that it was more than just words with you because you proved it with your actions. Lord, we think about the miraculous way that you came into this world. And we think about the fact that it's only possible with God. And when we look at our lives and the things that we face the turmoil that seems our world is in, the division around us, it, it, it almost seems impossible. But we know that all things are possible with you. It starts with having a relationship. And I pray that if, if there's someone this morning 
that has prayed that sinner's prayer and trusted you as her Savior, that they, you just let us know so we can pray with them, rejoice with them. If there's believers who need to come up this old-fashioned altar and pray today, I pray they would come to you as we sing together. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.